I don't understand why you write if you're not trying to effect some change in the real world, unless you think everything is cool, in which case, you know, we're on the other side of that. Like I said, you gotta choose sides, that's what it is. You always gotta choose sides. So what is the revolution? The revolutionary is always trying to do the most, trying to speak directly to the situation, you know, and to get people to understand that. So it's a hard gig because you find yourself always on the other side of what public wisdom seems to be. That's Amiri Baraka, and this is Alternative Radio. I'm David Barsamyan. This edition of AR features Amiri Baraka, Real Politics, Real Poetry. Amiri Baraka was a cultural icon and an iconoclast. He rose to fame in the 1960s as Leroy Jones. His 1964 off-Broadway play Dutchman created a sensation. Later, he became Amiri Baraka and was a central figure in the black arts movement. He was an award-winning playwright and poet and recipient of the Penn Faulkner Award and the American Book Award for Lifetime Achievement. He was the author of many books, including the classic Blues People. He was brilliant as a homeless sage in the movie Bullworth. His politics were uncompromisingly radical. Through his work, he explored the parameters of African-American culture, history, memory, racism, class struggle, and political power relationships. As an orator, he had a distinct and urgent style. He had a special affinity for jazz and such giants as John Coltrane, Max Roach, and Thelonious Monk. He once said of himself, I'm a revolutionary optimist. I believe that the good guys, the people, are going to win. Amiri Baraka died on January 9, 2014. Thousands turned out in his hometown of Newark to mourn his passing and celebrate his life. Over the years, Alternative Radio did a series of programs with him, including this one recorded in 2012 at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado. And now, Amiri Baraka, Real Politics, Real Poetry. I want to do two things, actually, or maybe not two things, but whatever it is. And uh, you're free, actually, to ask anytime, anything, you know. Uh, but remember, I can't hear well. I've had to listen to too much BS all my life, so you know. <laughs> the ear is reacting. But first, I know I was supposed to talk about poetry, politics, and reality, to make certain that you know that there are three vectors of the same kind of thing. Politics, culture, and art. It is material life, actual long-term livingness that determines everything else. So that the Ten Commandments, actually ancient Egypt's negative confessions, necessary for the dead to recite before entering, heaven or the land of the dead, are drawn from what humans were and had been doing for a long time. The confessions were done to codify, make clear what the most negative and self-destructive tendencies in the real world and hear these offenses as destructive to the whole society. So here the spiritual is a formula for removing the most egregious self-destructive practices from the society. They also were delivered by the art of writing the spiritual, even religion itself, in its most rational expression, is a tool used for community uplift. To make God or religion the shapers of the community that demand stability and positive social organization, the less directly the spiritual relates to the material, the less relevant it becomes. Culture is simply how people live over time. It's character consolidating. It is confirmed and reconfirmed over the years. Politics shapes the culture and is turned shaped by it. Ron Karinga said, politics is the gaining, maintaining, and use of power, unquote. That's how the forces that govern a particular society became those forces. U.S. culture historically is composed of sharply contradictory forces and tendencies. What aspects of it are most prominent is determined by the political forces that dominated at any time. 
U.S. Western or European dominated culture begins as an object impacted by a breakaway religious group from the old Church of England, derisively called Puritans. They felt the church had gotten to be too dominated by Rome as well as by the British monarch. This is what the cry of religious freedom meant. But this breakaway meant more than just seeking another form of religious practice. This movement in itself meant that another kind of culture was developing, one that carried with it the act, of, the act and ideas and spirit of rebellion and pioneering, but also at the same time, the practice, ideas, and culture of European or white supremacy. That culture would have economic features like its early mercantilism, which would be used to make many of the poor members of the society and, and prisoners indentured servants, so there's the white and the black, indentured servants. It also carried with it the idea and act of committing genocide on Native Americans, fastening slave chains on captive Africans, so that a certain kind of daring, even courage, was always mixed with an exploitive and oppressive feature of the developing culture, even as they cried that they were the inventors of free society and democracy. Mao Zedong in his lectures at Yenan, uh, which you should read, the Yenan lectures, if you haven't read Mao's Yenan lectures, you still got a couple of sandwiches for intellectual picnic you ain't got, because he says, art is the ideological reflection of real life. The ideological reflection of real life, that is what you are actually doing, transformed by your own ideological development. That's what art is. It's not anything from nowhere. It's from you and society, you know. And of course, poetry, as I said before, cannot just come from your head. You know, it becomes quickly boring. You have to be able to reflect on the real world, real life, you know. Uh, American art, since its earliest times, was bifurcated by its ideas of liberation and freedom on one hand, and its stiff reactionary formalism on the other. That is, you have two forces throughout history in the United States, free, slave, always, you know. Uh, you have great artists like Herman Melville, Movie Dick, Mark Twain, Puddinghead Wilson. Have you ever read Puddinghead Wilson in here? Anybody? Okay. You should read that. That will explain the United States to itself. You should read it. As well as the slave narratives, the narratives written for the slaves. And then the great Frederick Douglass, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass written by himself. So that's another incremental leap, revealing both aspects of the U.S. city and culture. The fact that Douglas could write this meant another profound development inside U.S. culture and the society itself. This is great art, but it's deeply political. So is Melville, so is Twain, you know, deeply political, and even boldly progressive. Emily Dickinson, as well, shows us a new aspect of U.S. culture, presenting the self-life of a young American woman. Or if you read The Diary of a Slave Girl by Linda Brent, they tell us something about the minds of the American woman, 19th century, both of them, slave woman and free woman. This is the United States again, developing this dichotomous, this contradictory culture. So if I'm reading Eugene O'Neill, I wanna know who was his contemporary, Langston Hughes. What are they saying at the same time about the same things? Uh, and that's, that's, that's where you have to keep a balance. You have to know what's happening. That's where you have to look happening. You cannot like entomb yourself in say, uh, Euro-American narrative about the world. You have to find out, okay, this was happening. Melville said this. What did Fred Douglas say? He said, Mark Twain said this, you know. What did the slave narrative say? You have to, get clarity, objective understanding is what we want, you know. A painter like Winslow Homer is so extraordinary because American painters of the time refused to paint the most fearsome happening in the American 19th century, which is what? The Civil War. 
Henry Osawa Tanner, the most famous black painter of the 19th century, carried a middle name, which is shortened version of Osawatomi, which is the name that John Brown was given when he opened up Kansas. You see, it's interesting that he would call himself Osawa, so you would know the identity with the revolutionary forces. And uh, if you want to read about John Brown, read W.B. Du Bois, a biography of John Brown. Melville and Twain and later Whitman and Stephen Crane were also anti the exploitation and oppression of their fellow citizens. Douglas and the slave narratives, Francis Watkins Harper near the end of the century, the common themes, slavery versus freedom. Wish there were as many good films about those themes. Most that have been made take up the slave owner's side, whether it's birth of a nation or gone with the wind. The actual other side of that struggle has not been documented. So that among this thousands of ugly films that are made, so few are made about real American history and real life of struggle. How you got to be you, how we got to be we, you know, why we're all related, whether we know it or admit it or not, you know. 20th century Euro-American modernism, Pound, Eliot, <laughs> reactionary U.S. authors, they went to Europe and stayed there. And I'm not saying that to just dismiss them. God knows all of us were addicted to them when we were little. They were modern English poetry. That's the time of seven, the era of seven types of ambiguity. Latin quotes, neo-English poetry followed their example. The academic poets of the US wanted a neo-Anglo poetry of formalism. Southern agrarians openly supported Southern pre-industrial values. They said industrialism was the enemy, meaning the conquest of the old Southern agrarian slave society by the North and the end of slavery. But struggle is always constant. It always incrementally leaps to the next period. William Carlos Williams and Langston Hughes are the great models for trying to develop an American poetry instead of imitating English verse. They went to Europe, but came back home. See, Pound and Elliot went to Europe and stayed. Williams and Langston went over there and dug whatever they dug and came back. And their line was American speech. American speech, you know. And then, of course, some other things I'll mention, the Harlem Renaissance, what that was, you know, was it uh, 40 years after slavery is over, there's a renaissance, people moving out of the South moved to Harlem, people from the West Indies, Africa moved to Harlem, and so you have a, a dynamic movement in Harlem and the black side at the same time that you have the development of Euro-American modernism, that is American uh, art becoming modern. You know, if you read early O'Neill, you'll see that. All of that coming out of the whole European tumultuousness that led to the Russian Revolution. So other things I just want to mention there on the way out uh, to another point, Du Bois, from Fred Douglas Du Bois, Liberation by True Self-Consciousness. Read The Souls of Black Folks. You know, read what Du Bois says about, about Booker T. Washington. He says, where Booker T. talks about thrift, where he talks about, you know, uh, that we had to do for ourselves, we accept that. But where he says we won't accept, uh, we're not interested in political struggle, we're not interested in higher education, we dismiss that. That was the great struggle of, of the 19th century, going into the 20th century. Booker T. Washington controlled black thought on the top until these young intellectuals, represented by Du Bois and then the Harlem Renaissance, got rid of him. They started struggling against him. The question of the double consciousness, to constantly see yourself through the eyes of people that hate you, to look at yourself with a mixture of amusement and contempt, whether you're black, or whether you're an American. We still believe that culture has an English accent. We still believe that England somehow is, is the creator of cultural values. The other thing, Langston Hughes, of course, the great Afro-American poet, the great poet, the great writer, in The Negro Artists and the Racial Mountain, he says, a poet says he wants to be a poet, he doesn't want to be a black poet. Langston says, I knew then he'd be no kind of poet at all. Zora Neale Hurston, Zora Neale Hurston, not only a great novelist, but a folklore 
studier, folklore, anthropologist. And that, what's important about that is that the Harlem Renaissance had an international break because everything we do in this country has an explosive relationship to the rest of the world. So the Harlem Renaissance, what did it do? They say the Harlem Renaissance. But it also engendered what was called uh, negritude, you know, in France and Africa and the West Indies. It also uh, uh, engendered something called indigisme in, in, in Haiti, that they should study their indigenous culture rather than just believe that they're French, you know. Uh, it's important so that when we talk about that, what is, what is the focus on ourselves? That we should study our indigenous culture rather than think we are just getting stuff from Europe. You know, we are not Uncle Sam, you know, the hick with the beard and the top hat. You know, we should see what this country's true consciousness is. So, and even in the Spanish speaking world in the Caribbean, you had negrismo, that is, to look at not just Spain but the African root, Nicolas Guillen, the great poet. How many people here read Nicolas Guillen? You know Nicolas Guillen, okay, great poet. Some of the greatest poets in the Western Hemisphere speak Spanish, you know, Ernesto Cardinal, you know, for instance, uh, uh, and the brother from El Salvador, Roque Dalton, who's related to the Daltons, you know, that, what was that movie where they ride out of there? Uh, what was it? Um, I can't think of that. The two guys, they end up jumping off the, the cliff. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, right. The Daltons ride out of there, and then one of them ends up in El Salvador, you know. And he has a son who is a great poet, Roque Dalton. That's interesting. That's United States Latin American thing, you know. Uh, also, the 30s, the influence of the Russian Revolution, for which we had to pay, still pay. Uh, my English professor, Sterling Brown, he was, a good, he was a great poet. I didn't know it when I came there. He was just my English professor, you know. But he's the one who pulled my coat, perhaps the greatest understanding of this country when he said he took us to his house because me and a guy named A.B. Spellman thought we were so hip, we didn't hear Charlie Parker, so we were hip. He says, come to my house. He shows us a wall full of records organized by time, genre, person. He says, that's your history. That is the music. He says, that's your history. You want to hear how these people were living? Study the music that is in the music is your history. In the music is the history of the United States. If you listen to the music, you'll hear, find the history of the United States, even the slave histories, you know. I may be wrong, but I won't be wrong always, the slave says. Yeah, I may be wrong, but I won't be wrong always. The sun gonna shine in my back door one day. And they slaves saying that, you know, always. So the history of this country is always a struggle for liberation against the kind of, uh, addiction to slavery, the addiction to formalism. Uh, for instance, and in, uh, maybe, you know, McCarthyism tried to silence everybody. Why? Have you ever wondered why the United States was allied with China and Russia during the Second World War, the fight against fascism? But after that, the Japanese and the Germans, who were our enemies, become our allies, and the Chinese and the Russians become our enemies. You ever think about that? What that means? The means that the alliances have switched. You understand what I'm saying? So that no longer are we fighting against fascism, we're fighting to be in control of it. See, that's, that's the point. And that's where you have to realize that your own life is at stake, your own consciousness is at stake, unless you know what side you're on. As my wife always said, what side are you on? It don't matter about your ethnicity, your nationality, the way you look. It matters what side you are. Who are you supporting? And so in this imperialist country, which as it began to have that imperialism dominate, tried to silence the three greatest black artists, Du Bois, Langston, and Robeson, 
you know, all three, you know. So when we come down the late 50s, I had just gotten kicked out of college. And then I went to the service. I got kicked out of service. It was two for two, actually. And went to New York, where I met this lady and some other folks. The question then was for we, the sons and daughters of the recent immigrants, remember that? The bill, the, what was it, the, the, the GI Bill, which said we could go to college. You know, that kind of new liberation. It meant that what we reacted to first was this attempt to impose Europe on us. This, this attempt to impose English formalism on us. And so that was the basis of what I would call the united front against academic poetry. And who was in that? Well, when I was in Puerto Rico, just before I got kicked out of the Air Force, I heard about a guy named Allen Ginsberg who had written this poem, Howl, which was banned. And they wanted to lock him up. I said, you could be locked up for a poem? That's heavy, you know, you could be locked up for a poem. I later found out, yes, you can be. <laughs> but that legacy with Alan and the, and the Howl, and what that was is just the, the first shot. When, when Howl came out, you first, that was the first shot of that revolution, you know. Again, what side are you on? Don't take the aesthetic cop out of not being for anything but thyself. That's why the poetry became so boring because too many people were talking about themselves, what's in their mind, the confusion, you know, the failure to understand reality and the fact that reality finally is what matters, that what you think is against or with reality. Poets have to be very dangerous because if your vision, if you can see something, you can't really pull punches. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? You got to say it. You got to say it. You got to put yourself on the line. Like in 1967, I went to jail for possession of two pistols and a poem. But the judge said to me, this poem is a prescription for criminal anarchy because the people burnt the town down, Newark, 1967. But because I could see that coming, then he wanted to blame me for doing it. You understand? If you could say, I see this getting ready to happen. If it happens, say, you did it. I said, Judge, do you think that the people came in my house and read that poem before they went out and set fire? You really believe that? Three years, no parole. But of course, we beat that, you know. So the question is of the, of the politics of all this. For the Afro-Americans, we're still struggling for self-determination and equal rights, you know, and uh, Obama, for all of the, the things that he does represent that are positive, still cooled out, was a cool out for us, if you understand. Uh, I wrote an essay in a poetry project publication a couple of years ago called Why Poetry, poetry is So Boring Again. And that's the substance of it. It's so boring again because it's not focusing on the world, but focusing on the inner machinations of its own fevered mind. When in the turbulent 60s, poetry was turbulent, was a reflection of those times. It was a reflection of those times. It was a time when we said revolution is the main trend in the world today. And it was, you know. And so if you investigate those things, the 40s in China and India, the 50s, the Puerto Ricans, when they tried to light up the Congress and shoot the congressmen, you know, you meet that Lolita LeBron, Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, Africa, Nkrumah becomes the Prime Minister and President of Ghana, and we U.S. children of the immigrants, and all the other things that were going on the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, the appearance of Howl, you know, the fact that it was called a beat generation. It's important. We wanted to stop the domination of the English departments. The English departments have made a comeback. You know, when you see Obama hooking up with, with Britain and France to overthrow Libya, you say, well, you're Britain and France? I thought they just got kicked out of Africa last week. 
So it's, it's a struggle, and it's not just a struggle among the black side. On, 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 on the whole American scene, it's the same thing. You know, the whole struggle against formalism, the imposition of Anglo, is because we came up with Pound and Elliot, man, the most anglo -philic. It's trying to learn quotes, learn Latin and all that stuff, you know. What, what, what were we talking about, though? So it's, it's important that we organize the arts to struggle for the domination of the people. If that doesn't move you, you can't do it. I mean, if you can't make poetry out of the actual struggle in reality, then you, you do something else. But it'll probably be boring. You know? Again, no matter what your temperament is like, you know, no matter what your relationship to the world is, you're going to have to talk about the world in it. Young poets always begin by saying, I love, I feel, I hurt, I want, you know, they talk about, you know, themselves, because that's how they come. They're talking about, you know, I yearn, I desire, but that gets old quick. I mean, it should get old to you. Because I think that the point of, 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 of poetry is that at one point, you're going to have to mark your own papers. You're going to have to mark your own poetry. You're going to have to say, oh, this is good, but this is an imitation of me. <laughs> you know, because that's the quickest poetry you can write, imitating yourself. You don't even have to think. Some people make a living doing that. But if you're really searching for some meaning, then you've got another struggle going. In these cities that we live, or if you don't live in a city, you live near one, what is the activity of poets? What is the activity of the arts there? Is there any kind of organized effort to put another kind of uh, dimension in the politics of that place? Like one of my sons, Raz, came back and became, he's a city councilman in Newark, and uh, the principal of one of the biggest high schools in Newark. Why? Because that's what we wanted for him to do, not to just go away and stay away and go be crazy with the rest of Americans, but to come back and help us. And wherever you come from, I know that's the sentiment. I wish some smart people, some educated people, some tough people would come back here and help us. You see, And that's, that's, that's the responsibility that you have to try to locate in your own consciousness. You know, who do, who do I owe allegiance to? Well, who saved your life, who wiped your ass, who fed you, who sent you to school, who cared for you, who protected you. you know, that would be first to find out who that is. You know, What is your allegiance to what? I mean, because if you say art, you could be talking about Hollywood. You could be talking about Lincoln Center. You know, a guy came up to me and Max Roach one day and he says, Max, I would like to be with you, but I'm legit. So what's that mean? But then it turns out that the conductor of the New York Philharmonic makes $2.5 million a year. This is a question of the elite understanding of Europe. They don't play any American music. You might like it. I mean, you know, I mean, you'd be kind of dull if you didn't like Beethoven and Mozart and, you know, so forth and so on. But at the same time, I want to know how come you're not playing James P. Johnson and Willie the Lion Smith, you know what I mean? Or at least Gil Evans. You know, where is, where is our culture? You see, what are we teaching to ourselves? Remember this, there, there are people walking around who think of themselves as socialists, but who would never run to be the dog catcher or the sheriff or the tax collector, you know. And a lot of those levers of power are still open if you will pursue them and understand them. What city you live in? How is that city run? Who's the city councilman? Who's the mayor? Where does the money come from? What are the, what are the creative aspects of that society? I went to Cuba in 1960. I went to Cuba. I met Fidel Castro and Che Guevara when they were young people. And what I marveled at was the fact that here's some young guys, young women, who had actually weren't just talking about revolution, who had actually taken over their country. That was impressive to me. How can you use what exists? This is the most advanced political system in some ways in the world, and in other ways, the most backward. 
You're listening to Amiri Baraka, Real Politics, Real Poetry. This is Alternative Radio. You can order copies of this program by calling 1-800-444-1977. That's 1-800-444-1977. Or you can order online on our website, alternativeradio.org. That's alternativeradio.org. Um, can't exploration of personal trauma serve the same purpose as something depersonalized? I feel that people respond more genuinely and learn more when I tell my own story, and the personal is political. Well, that's, that's what you have to game. That's your game. That's what you have to play with. You know, everybody has personal <laughs> reactions to everything. We all live, love, hate, you know, uh, look stupid sometimes, you know. We all do that. The question is, how is that useful in interpreting the world? You see what I mean? Not just to tell me that you have these experiences, but how is that useful in helping me interpret the world, in knowing what's going on? See, because to me, that's ultimately what art is supposed to do. There are people wandering around this planet who don't know anything that's going on here, have no understanding, you know. If you are supposed to be conscious, you're supposed to be trying to raise the consciousness of people, not just to, 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 to blurt out your own uh, stuff, although blurt happens sometimes too. But the question is, how, do you, how, do you, how, how can you raise the level of people's consciousness? How can you inspire people? How can you make people feel good even? Or to alert them to stuff that's endangering their lives. And that's, that's the question. It's not that you don't have personal trauma, et cetera. It's just how do you use that? You know, what does it mean? So what, what did Mao say about that? He said, okay, the first thing is perception. I perceive this. But then the second thing is interpretation. What was that in your life? I perceive it, interpret it. What was that? The third thing is use, which is the highest level. I can talk about playing the piano all day, but I can't play the piano. You, you understand what I mean? It's a question of how do you use that experience so that it becomes a, a useful experience, an inspirational experience, a consciousness-raising experience. That's what we have to talk about. Someone who's been in and out of academic life, most of your adult life, I wonder if you could comment on the political economy of university scholarship in the, the U.S.? Well, they have to try to get their scholarship to be real scholarship and not just repeating uh, the ready-mades of academia. And I made a statement saying that the university is the last bastion of colonialism in the United States. You don't teach anything about us you teach English literature, you know, you teach German philosophy, you teach French drama, you know. What do you teach about the Western world? What do you teach? I don't know anything about Canadian poetry or Mexican poetry or Brazilian poetry. I don't know anything. You don't teach that. And so you get into a controversy about that, you know. Education, what is it supposed to be? Equipping you for some safe job? in a know-nothing organization or to try to discover the real contradictions in life. And that's, that's what I say, you know. So if you go to university, you're going to find yourself in a struggle unless you be cool and don't say nothing. I tried to do that, but it didn't work. <laughs> you open your mouth at the wrong time. How do you define the contemporary revolutionary artists in the U.S. today? To define a revolutionary artist, you said, what, what is the status quo here in the United States? What are you doing to help overthrow that status quo, to eliminate that status quo? You know? So at this present time, what is the principal contradiction, as Lyndon used to say? What is the principal contradiction? You have uh, Obama and them. You know, and you have the Republicans and the whole uh, specter of corporate dictatorship. Yeah. So 
you have to fight for what is progressive in that situation, but also fight beyond that. You know, what do we need other than to stop those Republicans? We do need socialism in this country. But the first thing you need is a united front. And if that united front doesn't reorganize itself, and the artists have to do as much as they can to see that it does, despite our individual prejudices, our individual limitations, you know, we have to fight. See, I don't understand why you write if you're not trying to effect some change in the real world, unless you think everything is cool, in which case, you know, we're on the other side of that. You know. Like I said, you've got to choose sides. That's what it is. You've always got to choose sides. So what is the revolutionary? Revolutionary is always trying to do the most, trying to speak directly to the situation, you know, and to get people to understand that. So it's a hard gig because you find yourself always on the other side of what public wisdom seems to be. These people want to tell us we've got a great country, we've got a great country, we've got a great country, you know. You can get education free anywhere in Europe without having to pay, you know, this life-threatening, what do you call it, the loans that you have to take out to get out, you know, you understand what I mean? That's social democracy in Europe has been existing for a long time. The domination of corporation is limited in some ways in Europe by social democracy. This country is supposed to be feared in all of them, but they're not. They're not. And so the question of revolution is you have to keep talking about that which is most important to the people. Hi, thank you so much for being here. So you talked about us needing to take a stand on what side we're on. Um, and I'm thinking about that in terms of in terms of money. I mean, we're all you know teachers or writers, and a lot of where power comes from and changing whole systems is money. Well, you can, see, first, if you want to be a poet, it means you've sworn some kind of alliance with poverty. I mean, in the first place. <laughs> I mean, you should know that from when you say, I want to be a poet. That means you're going to be Pope. That's it. That's what poetry means, poetry. <laughs> but see, the point is you're going to have to make it anyway. I can't, I can't tell you. I wouldn't say you can't join a corporation. Why not? But you shouldn't go there to get crazy. You shouldn't be absorbed in that culture. You should still try to find out what you can do to overthrow that corporate dictatorship, you know, what you can do to create uh, strong united fronts of writers or just people to struggle against this culture, you know. You have individual kind of tasks which you will choose based on your situation. You must have money to live. It's a, it's a vast struggle, what can I tell you? I would love to hear you speak about how um, how we can construct a united front and what does a united front look like? Okay, first of all, you can only construct a united front around agreeing on a specific thing that you want to do. As diverse as you might be, as you are a petty capitalist, are you a, a communist, are you a nationalist, are you a Muslim, what is it that you can agree on? That's the first thing. Is there any one thing you can agree on and organize around? And now about that campaign with Obama, that was the organization. Diverse people organized, what? To get them elected. The question of any united front is what is that single or maybe multiple issues that you can agree on, no matter how diverse ideologically you are. And, that, and, and uh, you say for poets, it's gonna be difficult. But finally, no more difficult than, than organizing regular people. But that's the question. What is it? What is it? Now, for the black question, at first, it was simply, you know, national oppression. You know, we can organize against that. But even organizing against that, we found out that black is not an ideology. You know, that, that's, that's what we found. It's not an ideology. You're black, you got a Muslim, you got a communist, you got a Christian, you got, you know. So, so the question is, how can you organize? diverse ideologies around issues that can unite them. That's the, that's the secret of the United Front, you know. And at the same time, not suppress people with the stuff that they want to do individually.
See, like as opposed as Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were, I would rather them be in the same organization. We could struggle all day and all night, and at the end we would do like they do in Congress. I don't agree with that, but that's what we're going to do. When you get that kind of sophistication, see, I mean, you, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. You're going to face it. That's what it is. Think of all the people who resisted slavery, who resisted fascism, you know, all those people, what they had to do you know, to preserve themselves and defeat the enemy. That's always the question. Preserve oneself and defeat the enemy. That's what you have to do. So however you have to preserve yourself, because they're no good if you got to go, you know, but at the same time, you know, might be beyond your doing. But that's what you're facing. These people are not willing to give up what they have. This country belongs to those corporations and those people. We are just here temporarily until they can beat our ass into submission or drive us into exile. So that's the point. They're not giving this up. And even though there's a black president, look, you got to look at what that is, the positive and the negative. You know, they're not giving up nothing just because it's a colored guy up there. You got to fight to see that they don't get no worse. You see, people talk about the lesser of two evils. Better the lesser two evils than the moser of two evils. <laughs> you know, that's the point. Thank you very much. This is a poem, uh, this is in this book called Transblusency. And, uh, oh, great. And there was a poem I wanted to read here. It's called Heathens. My grandmother used to always tell me about heathens. She used to say, don't go out in the street and hang out with them heathens. But then I found out that the heathens was in high places. And there was heathens all over. Heathens. One, they ugly on purpose. Two, they get high off air raids. Three, they are the oldest continuously functioning serial killers. Four, they murder to explain themselves. Five, they think humans are food. Six, they imitate conversation by lying. Seven, they are always naked and always dirty. The shower and tuxedo don't help. <laughs> Heathens eight. They go to the bathroom to have a religious experience. <laughs> Nine. They believe everything is better dead, and that everything alive is their enemy. <laughs> Ten. Plus heathens is armed and dangerous. <laughs> Heathens in evolution, when their brains got large enough, they created hell. Heathen bliss, to be alive and ignorant. Devil worship is heathen self-respect. Civil rights bill number 666, the Negro Heathen Enablement Act. Quote, essentially, it allows more Negroes to become heathens. <laughs> Heathen technology and media seek to modernize cannibalism and make it acceptable to the food. Christ was never in Europe. <laughs> Da, 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 da. At lynchings, heathens wear white tie and formal hood and robe. In this frenzied ritual, they reconfirm the superiority 
of their culture. Heathens think fascism is civilization and that they are superior to humans and that humanity is metaphor. Heathens think fascism is civilization and that they are superior to humans and that humanity is metaphysical. Heathens think fascism is civilization. And that they are superior to humans and that humanity is metaphysical to understand that. Can you? I mean, really, can you really dig what that means? It's like monsters roaming the earth who sting to live, who know no better, who like wild animals might sing or make a sound some way that might pretend, imitate a human cry, the sweet rationality of love. Humans, humans, heathens think fascism is civilization. That is the art of it, that it exists and carries with it so many complexities, even that craziness, but then aesthetics is connected to the real, the deadliest of that. Heathens think fascism is civilization. The deadliness of that ugliness or uncomprehended smoothness, the technology of predatory creatures who feed on flesh, who beat on the tender aspirations of human evolution because they have no conception of humanity, except as that animal natural yoke, which they can see as somehow a reflex of what that might be. It took that kind of vision for them to understand the use of religion in the changing world to cloak themselves in the modest trappings of early Christianity, having murdered its prophet for power and profit. Heathens think fascism is civilization. Thank you. This is from a long poem called Wise, Wise, Wise. I got this from Jimmy Baldwin. Baldwin said, if you ask why all the time, you'll get wise. Just keep asking why, why, why. <laughs> and this is called, hmm, why don't you fight? This is, there's 40 poems in this, like, the 40 days it took to go from Africa to the United States on a slave ship. This is number 37 called, Why Don't You Fight? One more time. Music was Duke Ellington. Bum, 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 I am the missing link. This sad society, pornography rocket, your deaths now, sure to be comic, no longer led by even the abstractly wise, not even a champion vampire, the jug factor, ice pick in your bleeding brain. You heard the poets. You felt Jacob Lawrence and Rivera Understand the sheer angle of rushing pleasure, smile, learn. The spin inside Puente's pop, blue horizon and train. Animals should not be running our lives. Animals should not be running our lives. I want a human chance. Your house stinks. Dead things with bloody bones collect around your thinking. The poor, the smashed, slaves, ignorant gods, static ideas like money. Brand us all as jungle bunnies, blinking at the sun, tormented by volcanoes and earthquakes, depressed with colds and arthritis, wiped out by incredible idiocy, starvation, drought, greedy primates. No, it's a stupid world you've made, an ugly one. If I did not fall in love with beauty, I'd be cooler. The year, the state, the lie, the newspaper, as an aesthetic exclamation point. Think of music as the only soul God could have, could have, could have. Singing slaves, the slaves singing, they sing, they sing. Africa, spiritual, scat blues, rag swing, they sing. 
They want tomorrow, lost yesterday, pain today, singing slaves, the slaves singing, they sing, hey baby, knock me a kiss. See, light, there, see light, heaven, fire, reality described, singing, the slaves singing, singing slave, they sing, bop, cool, oh, hard, new avant funk, the slaves singing, religious history air, and pain and struggle there, the slaves singing, singing, singing. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to end with a, a group of little poems. Uh, when I was a child, I used to read Chinese and Japanese poetry. I was a weird little child <laughs> in Newark. So I came upon something called a haiku in Japanese. So I decided to create an Afro-American form called a loku. <laughs> we don't have a certain amount of syllables because we really don't have time to do that. Loku for so what? Bam 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 da 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 da. Es un poco loco. By Bud Powell. Da 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 da. Loku for so what? They ask him the difference between insane and outsane. He said, "You know the difference. That's why you ask it." Two days later, they came back. He had left a note. It said the same thing. That's when his picture went up in the post office. The caption read, wanted for any reason you can think of. <laughs> this meant they really did understand. <laughs> Question with nowhere. Why are they so crazy? 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 Why? Dun, 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 dun. The pet's reward. On Miss Daisy's deathbed, she told Morgan Freeman he was her best friend. So what about the dog? Dun, 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 dun. Silent night. Whenever the devil is disguised as God, he is called Santa Claus. Dun, 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 dun. Fanon, the cruelest thing the Nazis did, and the most grim, was to turn some of their victims into them. Adventures and negrosity. A Negro tried to cash himself for money at a bank. He got arrested as a counterfeit nickel. Dun, 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 dun. Culture. European Jews say the devil speaks perfect German. Black Americans, on the other hand, say he speaks pretty good English, too. Dun, 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 dun. Low coup motive. The devil said he left heaven because there was too many Negroes. That's why he started Europe. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Geobolical. According to the devil, when he was first thrown out of heaven, he landed in England. I believe him. Dun, 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 dun. Heaven appeared with property. God with slavery. Dun, 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 Craziness is no act. Not to act is craziness. <clears throat> Achtung. The American word for Nazi is American. Dun, 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 dun. Catch 27. The real problem is you don't know the real problem. Dun, 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 dun. Low coup for Bush 2. The main thing wrong with you is you ain't in jail. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Class gas for those who knows. Class gas for those who knows. Since the rich eat more than anybody else, it is reasonable to assume that they are more full of... Dun, 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 dun. In the funk world, if Elvis Presley is king, who is James Brown? God, thank you. That was Amiri Baraka, Real Politics, Real Poetry. 
He spoke at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado in 2012. Amiri Baraka was an award-winning playwright and poet. He passed away on January 9, 2014. This program is produced by Alternative Radio, an unembedded award-winning weekly series based in Boulder, Colorado. Since we began broadcasting in 1986, AR is independent. That's why we can feature voices rarely heard in the corporate media, such as Angela Davis, Naomi Klein, Vandana Shiva, Richard Wolf, Chris Hedges, and Tarek Ali. We have a series of programs with Amiri Baraka. To access our complete audio and book catalog, just go to our website, alternativeradio.org. Again, our website where we are podcasting, alternativeradio.org. To place a credit card order for a CD, MP3, or written transcript for today's program, Amiri Baraka, Real Politics, Real Poetry, call us 1-800-444-1900. Again, that number is 1-800-444-1977. Or you can order on our secure website, alternativeradio.org. That's alternativeradio.org. The Kronos Quartet performs our theme music. Gavin Dahl is AR station liaison. Joe Ritchie is our general manager and editor. I'm David Barsamian. Thank you for listening. Thank you.